So uh, in the journey uh, of people that I hold in high esteem, uh, Dr. Graham Parker at Wayne State University uh, is special. Uh, anyone who co-chaired a World Stem Cell Summit uh, in the last 20 years is special. And when we did our summit in Detroit, uh, it was circa 2010. And we had the support of the University of Michigan, Michigan State, and Wayne State University, as well as the, the state of Michigan. And it was a fabulously interesting meeting. Uh, certainly one of the, the, the things I enjoyed the most is working with Dr. Parker, who uh, serves as the uh, tr at the Children's Research Center of Michigan uh, Department of Pediatrics at Wayne State University. Uh, of special significance with uh, Graham is his uh, editorship uh, as the chief editor of three Marianne Lieber journals. Uh, it's, of course, uh, nucleic acid therapeutics, stem cells and development, and also gene times environment, gene X environment which is a journal that he proposed, and it's the impact of the world of genetics and epigenetics and environment, uh, where there was a, uh, a lack of a cohesive unified journal. To have someone so creative to convince Marianne Liebert of creating a new journal as, as such, and the broadness of, of Graham's understanding of the field, I find him to be a remarkable uh, speaker and presenter and a remarkable friend. So what he is going to speak about today is really a true hot topic. Um, the bioethical basis for health span. Will stem cells get lost in the translation? And in the world of advocacy that I've inhabited in 20 years, you run across the field of bioethics. Uh, I think of it as a secular priesthood of uh, folks that you can go up to and they will give you uh, good answers. You can do this or you can do that. Yes, but what is the answer? Well, it's the moral, you can do this or you can do that. It's framing issues. Now, my background is law. When my client asks me something, I say, you could do this or that, but you should do this. They don't always listen. So ethics is always an unshaky, a little shaky for me, but I guarantee you, after this talk, you will understand all you need to know about bioethics and the quandaries that we face in our field. Graham? Thanks, my friend. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. You could have spent your day doing anything, and you chose to spend it with us. Um, you're going to laugh. You're going to cry. Some of you might throw up. I mean, you've already seen some pretty hideous visions, but I'm going to tell you some stories that um, you're really going to want to tell other people. Uh, I do tell jokes. I tell jokes because the things I talk about are very serious. I take them very seriously, but just to get through some of the subjects, um, we, we're going to have to try and keep it a, a little light. Uh, here's my disclosure slide. If somebody doesn't have a disclosure slide, something's happening with my... my voice already. If somebody doesn't have a disclosure slide, then um, you should be very suspicious of what they say. Even a disclosure that you have no disclosure is a disclosure. Um, today we're going to understand how research advances can be a product of the environment. Um, we're going to explore how biomedical ethics can be in conflict with our efforts to uh, extend our health span health span, a phrase you're going to hear a lot at this meeting. Not too much during this talk, funnily enough, but there we go. Uh, and we're going to learn how editorial decisions can sometimes advance or hinder health span. So biomedical ethics. Those of you in biomedicine should know the four key biomedical ethics. I'm not going to embarrass people. I've done it in the past. It makes for a very long talk when you ask even MDs to name the key ones. So I'm going to tell you. Non-maleficence. When we think about the ethics of medical intervention, the, the thing that everybody talks about is do no harm. That is what non-maleficence means. The second one is beneficence. If I am a medical practitioner, practitioner and I have a way of helping that patient, I should use that ability and those techniques to help the patient. Beneficence, the second biomedical ethic. The third one, justice. 
If we have a way of treating a patient, we should be treating that patient regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of where they are geographically. This is the concept of justice in biomedical ethics. And the final one that you might not think about too much, but most modern uh, biomedical philosophers think is the most important, is autonomy. Is you as a patient having control over the decisions that are made about your body. All right, so do we understand the four key topics? I'm going to tell you some stories. And when I've told you each story, I'm going to ask you which of these ethics has either been contravened or supported by the work. Some of them are going to be feel-good stories. Some of them are going to be, pass me the sick bag, Josie, this one is horrible. So I'm going to tell you a bit about induced pluripotent stem cells. You're going to hear a lot about induced pluripotent stem cells at this meeting. I'm going to tell you how that's an incredibly useful tool to look at neurology. We saw some fabulous images from Frank Marini, but funnily enough, you cannot take a newborn baby and turn their head into glass to really find out what's wrong with that baby. Um, so being able to model things in the dish is an incredible way to learn things about disease. Tissue engineering, that's the one that's going to be a big problem for you. We're going to talk about COVID-19. We're going to talk about epidermal stem cells. We were hearing about skin. I'm going to tell you a wonderful story about epidermal stem cells. So. Those are the ethics. Let's get on with the storytelling. So, you probably know, mature cells can now be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. Who discovered that fact? Shinya Yamanaka. Right. He did it in 2006, right? With mouse, and then in 2007. What prize did he win for making that discovery? The Nobel Prize. When did he win it? Did he win it by himself? Did he win it by himself? Who did he win it with? That's Sir John Gordon to you, Alan Giacomo. Sir John Gordon. When, so he did his work in 2006 and he got the Nobel Prize in 2012. Most people in here that know the, how the Nobel Prizes work, that's pretty quick. When did Sir John Gordon do the work that he got his share of the Nobel Prize for? In fact, it's 1958. The frog that he did the first experiment on would be getting its bus pass today. 1958. That's a long wait to get the recognition you deserve. Where's the home of the Nobel Prize? The Karolinska, isn't it? We're going to hear more about the Karolinska later. IPS cells and neurology. Evan Snyder, who's going to be at this meeting, I don't know if he's here yet, has this wonderful way of talking about his wonderful work of modeling neurological diseases using induced pluripotent stem cells to create networks and baths of neurons to be able to study disease. He says we have a conceit. The conceit is that if we take a mature cell from a patient that has a disease, turn it into a pluripotent stem cell, and then derive the neurons that we're interested from that, that they will recapitulate. That's a good word, isn't it? They will recapitulate the disease we're studying. OK? This is very, very useful if you're studying a disease that we don't yet understand the genetic basis of it. Like, for example, Bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder used to be called manic depression. There are 7 million Americans suffering the symptoms of bipolar disorder every year. You know someone with bipolar disorder, I assure you. And what Evan did was really, really clever. He took uh, fibroblasts from patients with bipolar disorder. Does anybody know what the best treatment still is for bipolar disorder? Still lithium. And lithium is a nasty, nasty drug to have to take. But what he, we've, we know for a fact is that some patients with bipolar disorder react well to lithium, and some patients it has no effect. So great word for a, proteomic, uh, for a, a public day, proteomics, studying proteins. What he did was he took baths of uh, neural cells 
from patients that had, that were lithium responsive and from patients that weren't, and then studied the proteome, the proteins, to try and find out what was the difference between the ones that were lithium responsive. And I'm not gonna ask you to learn phrases like post-translational modification. I just want you to understand that certain proteins change their form and how those proteins are changed, in this case from unphosphorylated to phosphorylated, utterly predicted their responsivity to lithium. What they found in the dish as well, that if you lost the unphosphorylated form of the protein, you started to get lower spine density. But lithium thrown in the dish increased spine area and density. So what we're finding out is something you could never have found out by looking at the patient. We don't have big enough microscopes of any kind that would have allowed us to know that, but Evan was able to find that out in vitro. This is fabulous. Does it mean that we can now cure all patients with bipolar? No, but it gives us an insight into understanding why some patients are lithium responsive that then allows us to come up with new ideas of how to make that effect on that protein in the patient that doesn't have the side effects of lithium. Does that make sense? Yeah, hopefully. So, is Evan non-maleficent? Sure he is. Is he beneficent? I think so. Don't you think so, Gene? Sure he is. Is this available to everybody? It's published science. It's not sitting in the vaults of a big uh, biopharma company while they work out how to come up with a medication that they can then sell for an obscene amount of money. And autonomy. Hmm. If you give somebody your fibroblast and they turn them into iPS cells, they potentially could make a new Graham out of you. Um, but I'm sure Evan is not doing that. Okay, talk about a new Graham. Look at that young man. That was a young man with a NIH-funded career one day, uh, using iPS cells to model the number one genetic killer of children. Does anybody know what the number one genetic killer of children is? or was. Spinal muscular atrophy, one in 60. So at least someone in this room is carrying the genetic deficiency that causes spinal muscular atrophy. And if they meet somebody else, get married and have children, it's a straight Mendelian one in four chance that the child will have spinal muscular atrophy. Human beings have the gene and it took a lot of private um, donations from very, very motivated families to actually achieve the scientific breakthrough to come up with a characterization of what that gene is. And it's now not too surprisingly called survival motor neuron one. Human beings also have survival motor neuron two, which like most sequels isn't as good as the first one, um, but it does produce some protein, and you could have as many as seven copies of that. And if you've got seven copies of SMN2, there's no way you're ever showing spinal muscular atrophy. But that's why there's different forms of the disease. So, there's two different ways we could go about trying to treat this condition. One is to modulate that second version of the gene so that it acts more like SMN1, or we could use a virus to ferry into those motor neurons a replacement of the SMN1 gene. Agreed? We're still with me? We're still hanging in? Okay. 2016, FDA approves, approves Spinraza. This is using a sort of anti-6 oligonucleotides that my second journal, Nucleic Acid Therapeutic Studies, to modulate that second gene. And it works. So patients that would have been expected to only live for a year or maybe two years at the most because their motor neurons fail and then they no longer can breathe, are treated with Spinraza and survive. Does anybody know how much Spinraza costs? There's a hand at the back. Yes, Melissa. That's a great guess, but it's too high. 750,000, and you get four to six injections into your spine every year in order, but 
the patients now survive. What's the only thing you're worried about if you're Biogen that developed that technology? Profit, yeah, you got to get paid. No, it's the second treatment that was developed successfully and is now being marketed by Novartis. And it's 2.1 million, as Melissa really <laughs> guessed correctly for the first treatment. But it's only one dosing and it's IV. Okay. Non maleficence? Sure. Beneficence? Yeah. Justice? The British are still trying to decide whether they're going to cover the costs for, for that treatment. You might be surprised, and I certainly was very surprised to know, that Biogen has just cut the price of Spinraza by 95% in China. So justice, probably no. Autonomy, you're the parents and you've got a kid that you know is only going to live to one. You want that development. What I also want you to think about is all of those parents that in the early days were doing the bake sales, were going to the meetings with people like me and the other 120 scientists that were interested then in order to achieve these, these, uh, the knowledge that achieves those therapeutic breakthroughs. How do you think they feel about now having to pay 750000 a year? Okay, I'll move on. How am I doing for time, Bernie? Keep going. You sure? You sure you want me to tell the story? Oh yeah, okay. Hands up. Anybody who knows the story I'm about to tell. Gene knows it, yeah. Oh wow, there's a lot. There's, there's people positively waving. What is the Italian super surgeon's name? Paolo Macchiarini. Repeat after me. Paolo Macchiarini. Excellent, because you, you're going to want to be able to do that. Paolo Macchiarini, the Karolinska Institute, really, really famous for uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, really famous for um, treatment of blood disorders, but were very, very keen to extend their range of regenerative medicine. So they hired, hired Paolo Macchiarini, who had claimed to have successfully repaired the windpipe of a patient by taking the windpipe from a dead person and putting it into the patient. Okay? Between 2011 and 2014, eight patients, three of them at the Karolinska Institute with damaged trachea, received not a windpipe from a dead person, but a piece of plastic coated in their own stem cells to replace the windpipe. Cultured in a growth cocktail that Paolo described. Macchiarini told each of the patients that were operated on of his previous surgical success and the animal studies on which they were based. Publicity abounds, speaking tours to America, being interviewed on great shows with a producer from NBC. I don't have time to tell that aspect of the story, but you definitely want to Google his name in Vanity Fair. Okay. 17 patients are thought to have now died that were operated on. These are patients, I mean, I think two of them, their prognosis wasn't great, but the rest of them would have lived a normal lifespan, if not health span, until Paolo got his hands on them. One passed having been in intensive care since 2012. 40 procedures they underwent before they finally passed. No large animal studies as described to the patients were ever performed. There was only one large animal study done, and that was to test whether the piece of polymer would produce an immune reaction when it was stuck in the back of a pig. And it failed the test, but they still went ahead with the procedures. No review board at the Karolinska or the Karolinska University Hospital ever received uh, reviewed properly the procedures that he was undertaking. No permission was ever sought to use the growth promoting cocktail. The whistleblowers who were working with Paolo, as soon as they started trying to tell the people at the Karol Karolinska uh, that the patients were not doing well, that the papers did not reflect what was happening, um, they were told that they would get arrested if they spoke to anybody outside about what was happening. 
2015, an outside surgeon came in, uh, reviewed all of the work, and told the Karolinska that all of the work involved misconduct. The Karolinska rejected that review. 2016, the Vanity Fair that you definitely want to read appears, and 2016, the documentary that I consulted on uh, was broadcast. The man that made that uh, documentary really was intending to have a, like a hagiography piece about how great this regenerative medicine was that was proceeding, but he then realized quite quickly that things weren't going well. So what are the consequences? September 2015, Lancet published an editorial. The title of the editorial, you will not believe. It was Paolo Macchiarini is not guilty of scientific misconduct. Now, if in the Lancet you were to read a title that said, Graham Parker does not farm lobsters in his basement, wouldn't you have a sneaky suspicion that maybe Graham does farm lobsters in his basement? Otherwise, why are we talking about it? Um, 2016, the Lancet removed three of the authors from one of the papers that were published his work. No explanation as to why. Why the hell would an editor allow authors to take their name off a paper without publishing an explanation? Sorry about that. I cursed a little there, Bernie. 2016, an investigation that was opened had to be dropped because the investigators said they could not prove that Paolo's intent was malicious, that he was maleficent. December 2018, it was reopened. 22, he was found guilty of causing bodily harm but cleared of actually assault. He received a suspended sentence. The nature of that suspended sentence is not clear, but he is not in jail. Paolo Macchiarini maintains he's not guilty of research mismanagement and has always done the best for his patients. February of 2023, think about how long this story's going on for. I know, I'm talking for a long time, Bernie. Lancet publishes, finally, an expression of concern. It doesn't actually say what's wrong with the work. It's just an expression that, you know what? It's been a while. You might be concerned. OK, non-maleficence. Boo, maleficence. Beneficence? I don't know. He, he could truly be that sick in the head that he thought that what he was doing was going to work. Justice? There's no justice in this story. Autonomy? The patients? I've seen the video. I don't know. Anybody here seen the documentary? The, the, the guy that ran the company that made the polymer went to visit some of the patients before they undertook the, patients, uh, the procedure to assure them that what they were doing was great. I mean, you want to talk about conflict of interest? Okay. COVID-19, exosomes, into patients in the United States with the permission of the hospital where it took place. A lot, I mean, hundreds of papers on COVID and potential treatment with particularly mesenchymal stem cell-based therapies have been retracted in the last two years. Stem Cells and Development published this paper. I got so much hate mail about this paper. I continue to get hate mail about this. But as far as I'm concerned, they got the permission from the institution to do it. Why not share the data? Non-maleficence, none of the patients were harmed by the procedure. Beneficence, these patients survived and did well, whereas in a natural history experiment, other patients in a similar case died or did not do well. Justice, it was made available to all the patients at the institution, and there's now clinical trials. Autonomy. Again, the issue of autonomy goes right out the window. People are dying in the corridors of hospitals. They are not making a, a decision based on any sort of autonomous position. Okay, epidermal stem cells. We're still good, Bernie? Keep going. All right, who knows this story? Who, who knows? See, Jean knows this story. Jean knows all the stories. She knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, Hassan, a refugee from Syria, is in Germany. Luckily enough, even though he's not a very lucky person, he's lucky that he's no longer in Syria because his fate would have been sealed. Um, Epidemolus bullosa is a hard thing to say. This is where the Proteins, there's several forms, but in this form, there's a particular protein that is the junction protein that the skin hangs on. So every single 
skin cell is hanging on to your skin by this particular protein. Understood? Right. In this condition, that protein doesn't do its job properly and the skin simply flies away. That's why these patients are also called butterfly babies. I'm not going to keep that on the screen any longer. The kids in Germany at the premier burn clinic in the world. They've got him in an induced coma. There's nothing they can do for him, so he's in an induced coma. His skin is disappearing. Over 80% of the skin is gone, but they can do nothing for him. Somebody remembers a very gregarious and very smart, he's larger than life character, Italian, who said that he's got a technique to correct the genes that could be involved in this condition. But they haven't heard from him in years. So they call him up from Germany, he's in Italy, and they say, what are you doing, Michele? Why aren't you doing your work? And he's like, these guys, they want me, they want me to clean up the lab and use you know, good medical practice, and I, I'm still trying to set it up. <laughs> and um, so the, um, the very fine burn specialists in Germany take a section of skin that hasn't yet blistered, they send it to Michele. Michele's been studying epidermal stem cells for 30 years. He knows everything about how to culture these things. This is not a guy who's just fly by night and picked up a catalog and ordered some stem cells and starting to do work. He loves his cells. And he isolates them. I'm not going to bother you with the details other than the, to say that he knows which are the true, true epidermal stem cells and he then infects them with the corrected gene. So the gene that goes wrong, that means the skin falls off, has now been corrected in a dish. And he starts growing. He starts growing patch after patch after patch after patch. Sends them back to Germany, where these wonderful, wonderful surgeons apply them to the boy. The boy is not cured. But all of his skin has regenerated properly and has maintained. He now goes to school, he plays soccer, unfortunately he supports an Italian team, all the Italian teams suck, but I can see why he does it. Um, Non-maleficent? Non-maleficent. Beneficent? Absolutely life-changing. He should definitely get the Nobel Prize. Justice? He's now starting clinical trials, so it'll be available for more patients. Not all forms of epidemiolosis mollosa will actually be um, able to be treated by this technique, but there, there's a, enough patients that will. Autonomy, again, autonomy goes right out the window. There's no way the parents were gonna say, don't try. Okay, I've gone over. I somewhat apologize, especially to my good friend, Jean Loring, who's coming up next. I've told you some stories. I hope you understand most people in biomedical research want to do things well, and they want to do them for the best of reasons. But sometimes, some aspects of how they're doing it kind of get pushed to one side in their enthusiasm, shall we call it, to advance their role in what is being done. I've given you some tools. I think from now on, when you hear someone over the next few days talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it, I want you to think about those four biomedical ethics and think, were they all observed? Thank you very much for your kind attention. We thank Graham Parker and uh, one day, uh, we'll, we'll sit at a bar or I'll, I'll go over to Incendiary Brewery in the next days and I will tell you my own experiences with Paolo Macchiarini and the whistleblowers. One of the colleagues I work with um, uh, today in the Healthspan Action Coalition who unfortunately couldn't join us is Eve Harold, who won a, uh, a prize for writing about the plight of the whistleblowers that went along, went on for a decade. It was published in a in an online journal, leapsmag.org. And um, it's an unbelievable story of heroism. So thank you, Graham, for clearing up, and, and uh, now I don't have to worry about bioethics anymore. Uh, so the, the